excited. To, first of all, I guess I should ask if anyone has questions because I kind of raced through that very quickly once I saw um, that the Attorney General had arrived. So does anyone have any questions about anything that I mentioned? Okay, great. Um, I will be in the back for a little while in case anyone has questions and wants to just um, approach me individually. Um, very excited to introduce um, the Attorney General who has really made fighting bias incidents, prejudice, intolerance, hate, um, a platform of his time as Attorney General over the past almost two years. From the updated bias investigation standards that you are going to hear about a lot more later today, I believe, from um, Andy Johns, to the 2121 um, events that happened across the state last year with 21 county prosecutors about um, bias and talking about bias with um, community members to sharing his own personal experience every time he is able to. Um, I cannot think of a person who has done more to raise the profile of this issue around the state and very grateful to introduce you. So those numbers 
700 or whatever they truly may be are completely unacceptable to me. They should be completely unacceptable to you as law enforcement officers in this state. And the question naturally becomes, what do we do about it? Or what can we do about it together? And, and we'll go through some of the efforts throughout the day's programming of what we've done in New Jersey, but, but let me tell you what we can do. We can use all the tools that are available to us to, to prosecute those who might act out in a criminal manner on these types of hateful ideologies. We must use those prosecutions as a deterrent to show others that we have zero tolerance for this type of conduct. And that's where all of us in this room come in. And that's why in April, working with many people in this room, we updated those standards and guidelines and policies on investigating and prosecuting biased offenses, which had not been updated in over a decade. In over a decade. They did not reflect the reality of what we were seeing on the ground in this moment. And so finally, those guidelines now have information and guidance in there on biased crimes motivated on somebody's gender, their national origin, on disability. So they're up to date with our current laws. They include best practices for investigating these types of offenses, as you'll learn during the course of this presentation today. They include a victim-centered approach on how to investigate and prosecute these types of offenses. So I think that's critically important, and that's something you'll learn throughout the course of today's training. The other thing, and Rachel mentioned this, that we did was we stood up the Governor's Youth Bias Task Force. Uh, we did that in August. And the reason we did it is because that reporting, that report that was issued by the Division on Civil Rights, by the State Police, by our office, those 569 plus numbers from last year, one quarter, 25% or so of those incidents happened on college and school campuses. And nearly one half of the known offenders tied to those offenses were minors. So that prompted us to think that we could do everything on the back end to prosecute those who, that, who commit these types of crimes, but what are we doing on the front end to prevent people from getting on this path? What are we doing on the front end to discourage these hateful ideologies from taking root into our young people? And so that will be the charge of that Youth Bias Task Force, which as Rachel <coughs> mentioned, includes a litany of organizations from across this state who will come together and work on prevention strategies. And so I encourage each of you, if you have the opportunity to provide information to that task force or to provide information in the listening sessions that Rachel will be holding with the Division on Civil Rights, to participate in those efforts. What else have we done? In September, the, the governor and legislature enacted the Extreme Risk Protective Order. We did not have a means, as you know, to go and say, this person has firearms, and this person is professing some really, really dire thoughts and, and microments on a permanent basis, because we know from incidents that have happened in other parts of this country that red flags have gone up before people have acted out and killed people using firearms that they have. And those red flags need to be heeded to. And, and there's a process attendant to this extreme risk protective order statute that was enacted that we have used already in this state to take firearms out of the hands of dangerous people who profess hateful ideologies who were planning to do harm to others. So that is another tool that we have at our disposal. A topic that'll come up today as well, that's important to Dave and he'll expand on later, something else that we're doing in this state. It's not about explicit bias or hate crimes, but it's important. It's the issue of implicit bias. And the implicit bias issues are, are top of mind to law enforcement agencies across this country. We have trainings going on all across this country, but we weren't, I think, doing enough in this state. And so late in, in August, sorry, in June of, of, of this year, I mandated that the state police, the Division on Criminal Justice, all their criminal investigators, and our county prosecutors, detectives, undergo in-person implicit bias training. And the state police in-service is going on right now, and by the next four or five weeks, all of our state troopers will have been trained on the issue of implicit bias. Because it's important, because that promotes positive police interactions, it promotes positive community relations, and it's a proven, proven technique in improving our, our jobs, in improving the interactions that we have with community members. So I, want, you know, I think you're talking about that later today, and I want to thank you for doing that. So these are all you know, just a taste of some of the things that we have been doing in this state to tackle the issue of bias, whether it's on the criminal side, or it's in our daily interactions, or whether it's in our law enforcement interactions, to make sure that we're all doing things 
that are contributing to positive interactions and to public safety. You know, the statistics uh, that I mentioned earlier are pretty dire. And, 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 you know, sometimes it's easy to get a little bit discouraged, but if I think there's any silver lining in those statistics, the 700 plus, the 50% being committed by young people, 25% on campus, it's that involvement of young people. And that gives us an opportunity to actually do something, I think, to bring those numbers down fairly quickly. And that's why I think the Youth Bias Task Force is so important, but because it's young people, I think we could do something. And I, and I go back to uh, one of the best books I've ever read is Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom, his autobiography from 1994. And he says in that, he says, no one is born hating another person because of his race, his background, or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Because love comes much more naturally to the human heart than it's opposite. And so that's what gives me hope that because of all of our efforts, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's the DOE, whether it's the Youth Bias Task Force, whether it's the Implicit Bias Training, that next year when DCR and the State Police does that reporting, those numbers will come down. And each of you play an important part in that. So I want to thank you for being at this training. I want to thank you for doing everything that you do on a daily basis to keep all of our communities safe. And I want to just thank you for being partners in this collaborative effort. So with that, enjoy the rest of the training. Please stay safe. And again, thank you for everything that each of you do. Sir, thank you for coming here today and taking time out of your busy schedule to address a topic that's near and dear, dear to my heart and that I'm very passionate about, as I know that you are. If I could just indulge a second in uh, General Garrell, if you could just stand up here for just one second, please, I'd like to recognize some things that you've done. Uh, if I could ask again for the bias officers to come up front, the executive, uh, the prosecutor, the chiefs, and the warden, please come up front as I, uh, as I just talk a little bit about uh, our Attorney General. Uh, at this time, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our Attorney General, uh, Gabriel Graywall. Uh, prior to becoming the state's top law enforcement official, official, General Graywall was the Bergen County prosecutor, as he mentioned it, and it's there where he began to lead the state in bias recognition, response, and investigation. Prioritizing bias in his office and providing law enforcement with the necessary tools to combat hate. In 2017, Attorney General Graywall became the top law enforcement official in our state, our Attorney General. He brought the passion and commitment in recognizing, responding, investigating, and prosecuting bias incidents and crimes across the entire state. He began with implementing his 2121, 21 County, 21 Century Community Policing Law Enforcement Program, rebuilding, rebuilding broken bridges of trust between the residents of New Jersey and our law enforcement officers. One of the top priorities in his first year as Attorney General was to mandate bias incidents and crimes be prioritized, understanding victimization, reaffirming proper law enforcement response, bringing all the stakeholders to the table in each and every county, and assuring that we're all on the same team. Attorney General Graywall then continued to have his finger on the pulse by revamping and updating the Attorney General's bias investigation standards. By the way, you have a copy of those with you in your handouts. Updating law enforcement training, engaging even more community stakeholders, leading discussions, with victims of bias and with law enforcement officers, revamping and mandating a comprehensive response to bias at all time, recognizing the victims and more importantly, recognizing the impact of bias and what that, that impact, what that impact has on our community. Providing law enforcement and prosecutors with all necessary tools to combat bias and hate in all forms, and recognizing that bias, prejudice, stereotypes, all the things that lead to hate cannot be ignored. Attorney General Greenwald then emphasized educating our young children by forging partnerships with the Department of Education and utilizing his office with the Division of Civil Rights and emphasizing education as his primary tactic to reduce hate. All the time recognizing children are not only the most vulnerable victims, but sometimes even our perpetrators. Under the leadership and direction of Attorney General Graywall, he identified and united teams of community stakeholders, law enforcement professionals, educators, interfaith religious leaders, business owners, civic organizations, and young adult role models and everyday heroes from across the state. Together, we talk with one another. We develop plans to work together as a team to eradicate and increase the bias-based activity right here in our own backyard and implement a plan. In the history of our state, and in my over 30 years of law enforcement experience, 
There has never been a leader that has been more powerful than you in trying to recognize, respond, and eradicate hate in our state. Today, it gives me a great honor to present you, Attorney General, with our most prestigious recognition. In 2019, Tom Culp Sr. Uh, <clears throat> passed, in 2017, our founder, Tom Culp, passed away. Uh, Tom was our founder. He was a 45-year veteran of law enforcement, <clears throat> first retiring as a lieutenant with the Scott AG's office. Right after you took office, sir, he became uh, ill. And in 2017, he succumbed to cancer and passed away. I'm certain Tom is here today with us, smiling from year to year, and knowing that you are the recipient of an award bearing his name. This is the most exceptional award that we give out. It is no more fitting than a person deserving of this recognition than you. <laughs> you guys can take him high up and get rid of my double chin, give me a six pack. <laughs> It's the best introduction I ever had, given the <laughs> voice, too. <laughs> Attorney General, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So at this time, we're going to take a break. Uh, it's a well-deserving break. This will give you an opportunity to meet the Attorney General, meet the prosecutor, meet the warden and the chiefs. And uh, also, there's bagels and coffee. So 10 minutes, please be back.